Brian Timothy Finn and Jonathan Michael Chun stake out the music room at Sacred Heart College. Their early band is an awkward cross between the Beatles and progressive rock. But at Auckland University, they meet a fine arts student with other ideas. I knew that we weren't a good band. Stillwater, or whatever we called ourselves. But the minute Phil Judd arrived, just everything completely turned. I think Phil Judd, he's, he's from another planet, really. I only knew how to play, but at that stage, very rudimentary guitar was Phil would start tuning the strings to open tunings, and I'm not sure to this day how he knew how to do that. I think it was pure instinct. But therefore, different kinds of chords would emerge, radical chords, amazing chords. And it was a really amazing summer, you know, where we, he would start playing chords that I'd never heard, and I would start singing melodies over them. We would take all those elements that we think we have to have, as well as these songs, especially stage performance and uniqueness. We're not gonna have tight t-shirts and flared jeans like the rest of them. So all of a sudden, poof, we cut our hair, shaved off our beds. I wore my father's pants and his doctor's last shoes. I used to enjoy wearing a thin tie, you know? renamed Split Ends take an immediate leap into the big time, performing at a Waikato rock festival headlined by Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath. Great Now Waiho Music Festival was a real festival. New Zealanders really embraced it, even though we were a bit four years behind the whole thing. It had all the ingredients and that it was out in the countryside, man, and you had to live in tents, man, and everybody took their clothes off. I actually didn't at the time, but... Uh, most, a, a lot of people did, including Corbin Simpson, who was the opening act, and sure enough, he got arrested. Our manager at the time, Barry Coburn, was part of the promotional team for that event, and he thought, thinking that he was giving us the break of our lives, put us on 8 o'clock on a Saturday night, and we were booed off the stage. And I didn't realise it. You know, I thought it was going really well. We had no drummer. We were like a chamber band, almost, you know? delicate arrangements with flute and violin and acoustic guitars and bass, you know. And it was pretty chunky and gutsy if you were sitting in a living room, but on that scale it must have been like thin little sounds, wispy sounds. It, it was a, a real lesson in how we are not ready to take a big stage, but of course we wanted to do everything at once, so yeah, we, we took the big stage. We then went off and did smaller intimate venues, but always concerts, we never went to hotels. So we totally refused to play licensed venues where people might drink and turn around and talk to each other. We always wanted to have the entire room focused on what we were doing because we felt we'd put so much effort into it and we had something to say and we had music that we believed in so much that people should spend the time listening to it. Yeah. Undaunted by the Narawahia experience, Split Ends enter TV's new faces. Their performance is filmed off the television by proud father Dick Finn. I wanted to be on TV and be seen, get a chance to be seen, really. And uh, once we got into it, we expected to win. In the end, of course, it doesn't matter that we uh, got fifth. <laughs> but um, obviously everyone always remembers the Phil Warren saying that he thought we were too clever and, you know, we were too artsy or whatever the word is. And, um, you know, subsequent events proved him right because it took us years to find any kind of mainstream audience. They just made a, an impression in sort of every direction, really. And by the time they got onto television and were dismissed as being too clever and all, and all that sort of thing, there was a real... Now the divisions were starting to appear because Split Ends were a band that you could never imagine doing a cover version of Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap. You know? So they, they... Yeah, they were... For me, they were the real breakthrough. We were very purist in that way. We, we weren't doing it to make a living and we... Didn't, didn't expect to be able to get a record deal here. I mean, we knew we had to go overseas somewhere sometime and we were desperate to do so, but at the same time we were allowed that sort of beautiful period of a year or two to just develop at our own pace. Meanwhile, Split End's persistence and originality is starting to attract attention. They don't play that often, but when they do, it's a real occasion.
riding in the wings forever. We'll take the stairs. It's now or never. And the whole thing reeks of cheap striptease. The matinee idols, they all fall to their knees. They had a sense of drama about what they did. I mean, as I said, I wasn't really into the progressive rock side of things, but the early split ends had a real darkness and a real sort of um, edge to them. The uh, Christmas Pandemonium concerts was one in particular we went along and saw. In the second half of the show, they had the whole stage decked out as a beach and Phil Judd's lying on a deck chair, strumming one of his like, slightly demonic songs on an acoustic guitar uh, with a New Zealand beach scene around it that seemed like a complete contrast. And they blew my mind. I'd never seen anything quite like it. I, I walked out flabbergasted. And they were good for me, but traumatic for Phil always. I mean, he hated performing, even though he could put on an act, you know, he was very dark and interesting to watch on stage, almost scary. And he was kind of fearless, but he didn't get back the, the complete adoration and love that he probably wanted. It's at a Buck Ahead show that Split End spontaneously gain a new member, Noel Crombie. And we were playing away, and all of a sudden he just appeared, stood there looking at us up to say, this is something you're gonna have to get used to, boys. Pulled off his white gloves, put them in his coat pocket, pulled out two spoons and just shoot, do, 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 do. We just went, oh, that is so brilliant. Everything he did was so stylish and so brilliant. It's great to have somebody in a band who's not really in the band. Like, it's always a good energy. It slightly puts it off kilter. You know, the audience is never quite sure what's his role. And he was always one of those kind of characters, very quiet, enigmatic, you know. You'd never quite figure Noel out, but he was always immensely cool, you know. He was the coolest person that any of us knew. I mean, he wasn't even, didn't even seem to be trying, you know, that hard. We were playing support in Hamilton to Space Waltz, who had the big hit out in the street, and we were supporting them. And we were in the changing room out the back of Founders Theatre, and Noel just walked in with a great bunch of coloured suits. All fell about, laughing and, and to in joy. We felt a million dollars wearing those suits, you know, and it was just something that then made us different again, and we just love being different, you know? I think we blew Space Wars off the stage. That was part of it too. Every one we played before, we had to blow off the stage. I guess what I drew from mainly was um, sort of classical and contemporary circus and kind of vaudevillian imagery. I think, you know, one of the nice things about all of that, the costumes and the hair and makeup and everything, was that um, the pre-show ritual was very defined for Split Ends and we'd always be there an hour before the gig and we'd spend that time together getting ready. And that was a great gift that Noel gave us because it, you step into this magic reality all of a sudden, you know, you're not just in your street clothes and, you know, you, you do enter into this magic space and then you just go on stage and you're one thing, you're Split Ends. <laughs> Split ends take the plunge and move to Melbourne. But the Aussies like their rock without frills, and split ends are odd men out. We were having trouble getting work, and so we were sort of waiting, waiting for things to happen. We ended up staying in a hotel opposite the Lifesaver where we got the odd gig. I remember buying a, an electric fry pan at the local op shop and getting rabbits from the butcher because it was the cheapest meat and cooking them in the hotel room. I've never eaten rabbits since. <laughs> Former Invaders guitarist Dave Russell rides to the rescue, taking on the tough job of road manager. It was very difficult. Uh, the band was so different, people either loved them or they hated them. There was no in-between. Uh, and unfortunately, like a lot of the big pubs on a Saturday night, just weren't suited to split ends, so it was just disastrous. But we were lucky in that because we'd been announced as New Zealand Skyhooks, presumably because we put on some makeup before the show, they were curious to see us. So we played a gig at the Coogee Bay Hotel, and Skyhooks came along and took a big shine to split ends. Went back to their record company, Mike Gadinski, and said, you got to go and see this band. So he turned up and, you know, it just all happened straight away. 
Well, I remember the day I was actually signing Street Ends, they were playing with Skyhooks at the Melbourne Festival Hall and um, uh, they went over so bad that, you know, three or four people from my office came to me and said, look, you've got to be out of your mind signing this group. You know, they just got booed off stage. So I remember getting quite angry and saying, listen, I'm signing the band and, you know, I don't care what you're saying. And Gadinsky is great because he's got a whole infrastructure. So he had an agency in Melbourne, agency in Sydney. We suddenly got shows every night of every week, basically, driving up and down 20,000 kilometres in something like four months or something. By the end of the year, we were selling out halls like the Dallas Brooks Hall in Melbourne, which holds 1,500 people. So we, we'd built up that audience. We went into the studio and recorded the live set pretty much as it was. Very little overdub, we'd, uh, and, and we had limited time. I think the whole project took us 180 hours all up from um, the first note to the final mix. The result is an album called Mental Notes, complete with gatefold cover featuring a painting by Phil Judd. They had a, a, a huge belief in their music. That, that's one of the main things that sort of held it together and uh, it, it did become a bit of a, uh, well, we can succeed over, over these Australians, you know. I found myself in silver dreams I'm talking in my sleep Sheer self-belief is fueling a whole new school of New Zealand bands. The ends are only the beginning. They just don't mean. 